Hi, and welcome. My name is Dr. Tim Casey, and I will be giving a lecture today in the Holocaust Awareness series. Uh, the lecture is entitled, Hannah Arendt and the Origins of Totalitarianism. As a professor here at CMU, uh, and I've been a professor here for 25 years at CMU, um, I've spent a lot of time studying political philosophy. Uh, it's really the, the area that I consider uh, my, my bread and butter, as it were, uh, in my classes. And when we look at a, a question like the Holocaust, uh, we often, all the different disciplines are trying to figure out uh, what it is that, um, that caused this Holocaust, what brought it about. And uh, of course, in political science, we try to use political philosophy. We try to understand how the, the governmental structures, the political systems, the social structures, uh, are creating the, the conditions upon which something like the Holocaust, something so atrocious as having six million people uh, killed in the Holocaust, uh, something so focused, so, so racially uh, charged, um, you know, how does this come about? Especially out of a country, uh, Germany was a, was a democracy. Uh, Germany, you know, had an elected government, the Weimar Republic. Uh, they were in, you know, obviously struggling uh, economically and that sort of thing. Uh, but there's got to be something more to it. And so out of this questioning period, uh, trying to make sense of the Holocaust, if one can make sense of the Holocaust, we find a, a voice arising out of that midst. And that voice is Hannah Arendt. Uh, Hannah Arendt uh, was a political philosopher. She was born in Germany. Uh, a Jew in, in 1906. She was born in Hanover, Germany. And uh, Hannah Arendt uh, fled Germany in the 1930s, uh, in 33 actually, uh, ultimately ending up in the United States and spent the rest of her career teaching at universities such as Princeton, Berkeley, Chicago. Uh, perhaps you've heard of some of these. They're the North, South, and West, uh, and also the New School in New York where she finally ended up. She was author of numerous books as well. Uh, the one we'll spend most of our time talking about tonight is her, her very famous book, Looking at the Origins of Totalitarianism in 1951. Uh, but she also wrote a book called The Human Condition in 1958. And in 1963, she was uh, covering the trial of Adolf Eichmann, um, a, a very noted uh, Nazi, uh, his trial in Jerusalem. And she wrote a book about that called uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, The Banality of Evil. Uh, and all of these are really important studies in their own right. But I want to look at the origins of totalitarianism, particularly as it may be instructive for the conditions that we have today, the conditions of totalitarianism uh, that may or may not be existing in our society today. So let's begin by talking a little bit about this book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Really, what Arendt claims in this book is that it is a study of the rise of a, a brand new political movement, a movement that would not have even been possible before the 20th century, and that is in fact characteristic of the 20th century that gave birth to it. Um, and I will argue later in the conversation uh, that I think if we apply Arendt's ideas to today, we'd argue that it's even more possible today than it was even in the mid 20th century. She's interested in the conditions, not necessarily the causes of totalitarianism, but the conditions that make it possible. Uh, Arendt was captivated by the same question that, that we're left with, uh, how is it possible in a place like Germany? But it wasn't just Germany that she was interested in, and this is, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of her work is that this origin of totalitarianism is a case study of both Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia, the left and the right, because her argument is that totalitarianism is not characteristic only of a right-wing ideology or only of a left-wing ideology. In fact, it is a characteristic ideology as a whole and the way in which it's applied to certain conditions within society. So what we're going to try to do tonight is talk about that. Now, I would be remiss on talking about this book to not point out that the whole first couple of sections of this book is 
setting a preface to her discussion of totalitarianism directly. And that is, she t does a wonderful job of talking about race and particularly anti-Semitism. Uh, it's arguably one of the most in-depth studies of anti-Semitism in Europe since the 19th century. Uh, still a, a hallmark classic for helping us understand the anti-Jewish question. But the argument about the Holocaust is that it's, it, it is not just Jews who died in the Holocaust, although they are by far the largest number of people that died, six million. But there were many other people that died in the Holocaust, right? These are people who are supporters, people who might have had a different sexual orientation, might have had a different uh, intellectual orientation, might have had uh, communists themselves, Ukrainians, uh, different racial groups, and so forth. And so we have to understand how the system built beyond simply anti-Semitism. Not to dismiss anti-Semitism by any means, but to help understand that in a larger context. And that's particularly true also if we remember that this isn't just about the Nazis, this is also about Stalinist Russia, in which the Jews were also persecuted in Stalinist Russia. There is also anti-Semitism in Stalinist Russia, and that is a significant contributor to the number of people that died in Russia independent of the war. But once again, it's not the complete story. So let's get into how does this come about? What is totalitarianism and why is it so different and so new? The thing about totalitarianism is that as the name implies, it is total domination. It is not just authoritarianism, uh, which is content with having authority over a limited sphere, a complete authority, but over a limited sphere of your life the political sphere, the public space, this area where we get together and talk about things. But instead, this is a, this is a uh, total control, right? The distinction between public and private seem to have just evaporated. So for totalitarianism, it's not enough for them to just see how you behave when you're around other people. It's getting you to behave the way you'd li they'd like you to behave when you're not around other people. They need to get into your mind. They need to get into that private space. They need to sort of break open those barriers where we say, hey, this is just my group of friends. This is just my family members. This is just me thinking myself. Totalitarianism requires complete and utter obedience. And in order to achieve that, there's a variety of mechanisms that they use. Probably the most important mechanism is the mass movement. And Arendt makes the argument in her book that mass movements are a phenomenon of the 20th century. This is one of the reasons that she argues totalitarianism could not have happened before this time, because we had not had the ability to create mass movements. One of the things that gives us that ability is technology. Technology allows that control to be total because technology goes beyond what you would have in a public sphere, beyond a talk like this, beyond a political speech that you might hear in a courtyard or something like that, or in a, in a stadium setting or whatever. Technology allows it to penetrate deeper into your homes, into your lives. And this was true when the technologies she's talking about are just mass communication, like the television in its very nascent stage, and the radio, more importantly, ways of communicating. Can you imagine what Hannah Arendt would say now about all the technologies? We willingly carry these things in our pockets so that they are totally and always with us. For most people anymore in our country, this is the last thing when we go to bed. Of course, we tell ourselves it's very practical. We're setting the alarm clock, so that's why we're touching it last. And then as soon as the alarm goes off, we pick it up and immediately need to find out what had gone on in our world. So we are willingly being accomplices. And so it's technology and mass movements. These are two of the most important things. Finally, the globalization, the globalized focus on power. This is something that, that animated both Stalin and Hitler, and indeed uh, arguably animates any would-be totalitarian into the future. But we don't really have a sense of globalization until the 20th century. 
So it's in the 20th century that totalitarianism, not just dictatorship, not just authoritarianism, because those all existed prior to this, but the total control. And that's the dangerous part of it for Arendt. How do they do this? They do it through a series of mechanisms. I'm going to go into more depth in each one of these, but I want to introduce them now in this part of the talk. They transform class into mass movement. They manipulate mass movements, and we'll talk a little bit more in a few moments about how that's done. The second thing that they do is they isolate the individual. The isolation and the loneliness of the individual are preconditions for a totalitarian regime. If we do not feel isolated and separated from our fellow citizens, it is impossible for totalitarian regimes to be able to take a good hold. Hannah Arendt argues that both mass movements and that isolated individual are absolute preconditions for totalitarian regimes. But there's more to it. There's also propaganda. You have to tell a compelling narrative. You have to tell a compelling story. It's a propaganda, and it's a distrust of alternative sources of information. And this is the difference, right? Everybody has propaganda. Actually, I always tell my classes, you know what propaganda is? Something somebody else does, right? You never meet anybody that says, I do propaganda for myself. It's always what somebody else does, right? But propaganda is about controlling a story. And in order to be effective at controlling the story, you not only have to tell a good and compelling story, you have to make sure that no other story seems more believable. And the way in which you do that is you have to use your propaganda not only to tell your story, but at the same time denigrate and, and dismiss and, and, and discount any alternative sources of information. And that's really critical. And I think we're seeing that uh, in some of our world today. We'll talk about that. Maybe we'll even have time with the questions and answers to talk a little bit more about that. Terrorism also becomes an important tool, according to Arendt. But it is state terrorism. And in this case, she's very particular about terrorism. We're not talking about the sort of jihadist blowing up a building, uh, that sort of thing. I mean, there are elements that are the same there. But for Arendt, what she's talking about when she mentions terrorism is about the random attack. Because the random attack makes people feel vulnerable and afraid all the time. So the state who systematically attacks people is not nearly as effective as the state who seems to attack people without any clear understanding as to why. Our human mind, the human condition, Hannah Arendt suggests, is one in which we, we desperately seek rational understanding. We are, we're constantly trying to make sense of the actions that take place, especially actions from something like the state, right? Because it's the government. Surely they have reason, rhyme, whatever to their, to their purpose. But Hannah Arendt argues that in a totalitarian system, that edginess, that unpredictability of the state is precisely the tool the state needs to make everybody think they could be next. Right? What happened after 9-11, what was so effective about the terrorists and 9-11, is that we believed it could happen again. We believed, in fact, that there was no rhyme or reason to why a particular building in New York came down. It was just being an unlucky place at a time. And we're always in a place. And we're always in a time. Which means we always, too, could be attacked. And that's the concern. You also want to pay attention to, and this is where the Holocaust awareness conversation comes back into play. The anti-Semitism comes back into play. And that is that one of the prime mechanisms of totalitarian governments is the demonization of other people, of other groups of people. Okay? So this anti-Semitism, and she argued not only anti-Semitism, but also imperialism. The Jew as an alien to the nation. And racism was used to justify imperialism. 
people that were conquered in the colonies were people of a different race, people of a different color, people who seemed to be maybe somewhat less human than the people that were conquering them. And to the extent that you create racial hierarchies, she argued, you create the justification for imperialism. And imperialism allows you to extend that totalitarianism beyond your borders. And so it's both important to have anti-Semitism or some sort of uh, racial overtones as well as this justification for imperialism. And finally, it's the attempt to end resistance from any corner of the world. That's what imperialism does, right? Tries to stop that because there's always the potential for the counter-narrative. And we're going to hear this theme over and over again for the rest of this talk as we begin to, to unfold and unpack what it means to be a totalitarian government. One of the main fears of the totalitarian government is that people will walk away. People will wise up and walk away. And so in order to stop that, you have to be total. You have to take away any other option, any other loyalty that they have, any other explanation that they have. It has to be total. So let's talk first about recruiting and the importance of the masses. The thing about the masses is that they're citizens that are left out of traditional political parties. Okay, these are citizens that most parties won't pay attention to, right? Have you heard that recently? People saying, I don't belong to either political party. That creates the potential, the condition for a mass movement. When people begin to feel that the parties no longer represent them, that the parties are no longer interested in them, then they don't have a legitimate channel to go in to the government or a legitimate t channel to petition the government. And when they don't, they begin to look for alternative channels. Generally, what they do is they just shut down and say, well, if the politics doesn't want me, then I don't want the politics, right? So the masses are often ignored politically by these parties, generally because they're seen as too apathetic. Well, they're not going to vote anyway, right? And if they don't vote, why do we care? They're, they're of no value or no use to us as a political party if they're not a vote, okay? If they're not going to contribute in some way. Beyond that, parties often masses because they're too ignorant. They're not smart enough. And this is going to be an important seed. There's sort of a basket of deplorables. Isn't that the word that Hillary Clinton used from time to time, right? I'm not suggesting that Hillary is driving people into a mass movement. I'm suggesting that that kind of language allows for the conditions of a mass movement to exist. You need a group of people who feels um, isolated and ignored by the traditional political parties, and in fact, not only isolated and ignored, but denigrated and looked down upon. Then the masses need one more spark. They need a charismatic leader. And that charismatic leader hitting at a, per, a particular time or condition when maybe economic challenges are coming up, right, where there's, there's a lot of mass unemployment, and that was certainly true in Germany and also true in Russia at the time, right? People are feeling alienated from their political system. They're feeling alienated from their neighbors. They're feeling isolated from everybody. And they're also uh, struggling economically. And then you get a charismatic leader, a leader who can articulate those things. Sometimes it's not just economic dislocation. It can also be times of rapid social transformation which is yet another reason why I think it's worth reading or rereading Hannah Arendt in our own time. Because we are in a time of rapid social transformation on all sorts of levels. And so it's not that totalitarianism has to come around the corner or automatically is going to come around the corner or that economic crisis caused totalitarianism. But remember that Hannah Arendt is interested in the conditions, the origins of totalitarianism. What conditions made it possible? It's also fueled by a distrust or, or feeling of betrayal by traditional political parties. And their desire is to follow a leader who seems to be the only one that can articulate those concerns, right? Have we seen that in contemporary leaders? Seems like the kind of thing that we hear from time to time. Oh, they're the only one that speaks like I speak. They're the only one that, that, that understands me. Well, certainly Hitler had that kind of charismatic hold 
on the large group of Germans who felt alienated from their political parties, who felt uh, betrayed by those parties perhaps, especially because of uh, tre you know, agreements that were done through the Treaty of Versailles and so forth. The political leadership had lost all credibility. And along comes Adolf Hitler, sort of seen as a man of the people, whether he was or he wasn't, right? Along comes Joseph Stalin, when, when somehow communism under Trotsky and Lenin had sort of failed people a little bit, right? And Stalin can come and say, no, I'm a man of the people. I speak just like you. I speak very plainly. I speak my mind, that sort of thing. I artic articulate your concerns. The masses then are often treated towards a, a, a sort of resentment of the intellectual. And this is very common in totalitarian systems, both on the left and the right. They strike out at the intellectual. This is maybe one of the reasons that political theorists are constantly for fear we might be the next uh, target or something. But it's misdirected. What they're experiencing is a sort of alienation from modern society. This, this, it seems like the society has progressed some point past where they are. And they think that the intellectuals were claiming the, the glories and the wonders of technology and the glories and the wonders of progress and intellectual life. And look at what we've done. We've been able to figure out all the diseases and we've been able to figure out all these sorts of things. They're, they're, they're concerned that these intellectuals have actually created the condition which has caused them to feel so alienated from their society, so left out, so left behind. And so when you get a significant portion of your population that feels left behind, that feels resentful towards intellectuals and others, leaders, particularly political parties, when those masses are formed by individuals who live isolated from others in their society, they might communicate with them from time to time, but they always feel alone. They always feel as if nobody else understands them. And when you have those conditions, it is ripe for the spark of a charismatic leader to come on. That leader usually doesn't, isn't able to, to just say, I'm a wonderful person. You should follow me. I know nobody else that you trust, but you should follow me all on his own. Instead, he creates a cycle of fear. He creates a cycle of fear through scapegoats and traitors. So we'll start first with the idea of the scapegoat. The scapegoats are absolutely necessary to the totalitarian project, according to Hannah Arendt, because they divert anger from those isolated individuals. This can be directed externally towards some other, or it could be directed internally towards a traitor. So you have scapegoats, you have traitors. Scapegoats are people on the outside, groups on the outside that you blame. So Hitler, for example, was most famous for blaming the Jews. The Jews are the cause of all this. The Jews are the bankers who have taken all your money. And if you feel poor and alone and isolated and you're worried about how you're going to cover your, your future, you can blame. You have somebody to blame. You know who is causing this to you, right? So it's that group, whatever that group is. But there's a, 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 a tremendous focus on that. And what happens then, the internal dynamics are really quite interesting. And Arendt is, is, is as shrewd, I think, about psychology as she is about philosophy. She suggests that what happens is a sense of fear overtakes members of this mass movement. And that fear is first about being labeled a traitor. They're afraid that they're going to be considered a traitor and thrown out of the movement, the one thing that gives them a sense of belonging. And so what they will do instead, to use a modern phrase, throw anybody else under the bus. Right? They will prove their loyalty by sacrificing others, Okay, by naming those people who are an enemy to the nation, those people who are an enemy to the people, right? Because their fear is that if they don't accuse others of traitor and conspiracy, somebody might accuse them of traitors and conspiracy. They may be on the outs. They may be the target, and they don't want to do that. And so their fear of being the target makes them more compliant to create targets internally. 
Not only that, their fear of being labeled other, their fear of being labeled um, less than desirable, drives this racial dimension, keeps members patrolling the boundaries of their group identity by emphasizing difference, by saying, oh, and Jews are like this and we are not. Oh, and uh, Westerners, capitalists are this way, because that, that, was, that was Stalin's group, right? His group, his other, was not necessarily always the Jews. It was the capitalists. It was the Western countries. It was those people who had not yet gone through the socialist revolution. Um, and so the fear of being on the outside causes them to patrol the very boundaries, the very borders between inside and outside. And once you get that dynamic going, where they're patrolling the inside and tossing people out who look even slightly disloyal because they're afraid of being tossed out themselves. And once you get them patrolling those boundaries so that they're constantly tossing people uh, under the bus, uh, different races, different groups of people, different enemies of the state, right? Um, then you really have a momentum for that movement. Hannah Arendt on page 323 of, of the copy that I have of the origins of totalitarianism, I wanted to quote a few quotes in particular that really are telling. She said that the most conspicuous external characteristic of the mass movement is the demand for total, unrestricted, unconditional, and unalterable loyalty of the individual members. This demand is made of the leaders of the totalitarian movement. So that character, charismatic leader, above all else, has to make it about him. I guess it could be her as well, but I will use the gendered term him for now because we're talking about Hitler and Stalin specifically right now. It has to be about Hitler and loyalty to Hitler, above all else. Der Führer, the leader, that's all they called him, right? Same thing with Stalin. Uncle Joe, actually, is what they called Stalin, right? This notion that he's, he's kind of their, their family friend, their, their colleague, all that sort of thing, right? But it has to be unconditional. And if you challenge the leader, that is the worst cardinal sin, right? You are immediately cast out of the movement. You are immediately pushed to the side. You're immediately marginalized. And so isolated individuals, in the midst of a fear of being tossed out of the movement, in the midst of a fear of being labeled as one of those others that the movement targets, in a deep sense of loyalty, begin to find their sense of place, their world of belonging. They belong to the movement. And that might be the only place. It's a, it's a salve. It's a way of drawing them out of their isolation. So they have to be isolated first, and then they're drawn out of the isolation into this belonging and they'll do anything to stay in that belonging. That's why it is totalitarian. That's why it is total. So what is the content? The most important thing of the movement is this belonging. It's not its ideas. What's really hard for us as political philosophers, whenever we're confronted with totalitarian movements, is we say, well, they don't make any sense, right? If they were conservative, they would believe in this, this, and this, and they believe in some of that, but not this, and they, this is not conservative. Or if they're liberal, they would believe in this, this, and this, and they believe in some of that. It doesn't really matter. And even if they contradict, maybe they believed it one day, and they completely contradict themselves six months later. Is that a problem? It is for a political party, because people rely on political parties with consistent messages. For a mass movement of a totalitarian regime, it is not a problem at all, as long as the leader is the one that said something one day and six months later said completely the opposite, it is still part of the movement. It is not ideas. It is um, the, the belonging that is most important, total loyalty. And this is a long paragraph that I just pulled up, so I don't want to <laughs> have to read too much. Um, but if the idea is that if you focus on political ideas, this allows people to have differences of opinion, right? What should we do? How should we fund education? Should we fund it through a tax? Should we fund it through uh, private you know, funding? There can be differences of opinion on this, right? People can, can, very rational people can come to very different conclusions about this sort of thing. And when they can, 
they can leave the movement. If it's based on an argument and they think the movement has a faulty argument, they just leave the movement. But if their only focus in the movement is belonging, there are no arguments to be made regarding policy. It's only the emotional conviction of belonging. Thus, total loyalty it means that there is, uh, it, only if there is no content. If there's content, there's something to walk away from. If it's belonging, it's a feeling. And that's what makes totalitarianism so pervasive. This politics of identity, it replaces the politics of argument, okay, the politics of policy. And this allows the state to then penetrate beyond the traditional domain of public policy. Public policy, our disagreements about policy, are the kind of stuff that we talk about when we meet together, right? When we gather in a group and that sort of thing, right? They're not the kind of stuff that we think about when we're alone, per se, right? She argues that that public policy stops at the door of your house. Going into your house, though, you carry your identity with you. You carry your sense of identity with you. So totalitarianism, by focusing on identity rather than policy, doesn't have to stop at the door of the house. It walks itself all the way on in. It comes right into your bedroom, as it were, right? So it controls the internal dynamics of identity. It gets inside your very head, as opposed to policy, which is about how do we collectively manage our problems, right? We've got, a, we've got this problem. There's water on the floor, how are we going to get this taken care of, right? That's a public policy kind of a thing. That doesn't have anything to do with your identity. You don't grab the mop and say, I've always wanted to be a mop maker uh, and start mopping the floor, right? I mean, it, that's, that seems silly. So identity is a much more deeply personal thing between public and private space. And for Hannah Arendt, this is critical. The other thing that, that makes it complete, if there is a policy at all, if there is any content at all to the totalitarian movement beyond identity, it is breaking things, disruption of a system that they feel has left them behind or made them feel alone. It's one of the greatest attractions of the masses to the charismatic leader. And so the better the leader is at breaking things, the more unconventional that leader is, the more they like that leader. The goal is to break the system they don't like and create a new one. Adolf Hitler did that. The Weimar Republic is ruined, it's failed, it has failed us as Germany, it's betrayed us as Germany. There is no salvation in the Weimar Republic. We must tear it down and build something new, a Third Reich. Joseph Stalin did the same thing. He didn't abandon communism, but he completely transformed the notion of communism. Our modern notions of communism owe much more to Joseph Stalin, I would argue, and Hannah Arendt would argue, than they owe to Karl Marx initially. I mean, Marx had a lot of the base philosophy. Don't get me wrong. Marx is important for communism. But communism as a, as a totalitarian regime is Stalin, not Marx. Marx actually argued that communism would, would be the withering away of the state. And there'd be no purpose to the state. The state is there to manage the collective affair of capitalists. When you're done with capitalism, when you're done with capitalists, there's no reason for the state anymore. The state will eventually wither away. There may be a transition period where people who are used to the state still expect the state to be around, but pretty soon we'll say, there's no purpose to the state and it's gone. Right? So Joseph Stalin is breaking the state, but he's doing so by, by, by building a new state rather than letting the state wither away. Okay. And, and so he's, he's considered a very uncouth character. I mean, I don't know if you know much about Joseph Stalin, but Joseph Stalin was, he comes from a, a kind of a more rural area of Russia. He was, he was generally seen by the intellectuals like Bakunin and Trotsky, these kind of really big intellectual characters who are running the early part of the Russian Revolution. They just see Joseph Stalin as a thug. Like, he's, he's, he's the kind of guy you need to keep around because there's some things you need to get done that you don't really want to claim get done, but you need somebody to do them. Joseph Stalin was your guy, right? But he's, he, but he's very uncouth. He's not sophisticated in any way. He doesn't try to be sophisticated. And that was what makes him a great charismatic 
for this movement because he's leading people who are not necessarily wanting to be seen as sophisticated. They, in fact, find the sophisticated the very problem that they're facing. So a person who is like the anti-intellectual is one of the perfect characteristics for a charismatic leader. Propaganda is very, very important as well. Let me just do a quick time check and see that we're, okay, we've got plenty of time. Propaganda is highly emotional in its appeal. So you have three different approaches uh, when we look at political philosophy. We talk about ethos, pathos, and logos. Okay? And ethos is this idea of the ethics of something, right? Logos, at the root word for logic, right, is the idea of the argument behind something. But pathos or pathos is the emotion to something. And so propaganda works primarily on an appeal to pathos, on an appeal to emotion. It gets your blood boiling. That's what propaganda is all about. And it's critical of facts. The, it, it offers, you know, any facts that are offered by other sources in particular, right? So they're independent sources of information, journalists, political parties, any source that does not come from the movement, and particularly from the movement's leader, is suspect. The leader will always tell you truth. All of those others tell you fake news, lies, right? So as you break down any other source of truth, the only thing left is the total source of truth, which is the leader, okay? So this is how the conditions become riper and riper. The leader uses a series of predictions about the future to guide the movement towards some objective in the future and away from others. You will hear leaders say, I, I predict this is going to happen. I promise you this will happen. This is going to happen. You watch me. This is what's going to happen. They, will, they tell you what won't happen, but this is what's going to happen. If you've ever heard leaders starting to do that, get very nervous. Because they're using the techniques of totalitarianism, this notion of prophecy. In fact, Hannah Arendt suggests that the chief qualification of a mass leader is that they become unendingly infallible, to use her words. He can never admit an error. Does that sound familiar? That's the key to the leader. Because when the leader says, yeah, I could be wrong, then you begin to start looking for alternative sources of information to find what right is. And so you, you lose your faith in the leader, you lose your focus on the leader, and therefore the leader loses his power over you. So even if the leader is caught in a lie, even if the leader is caught in a hundred lies, the leader cannot admit to one of those lies. Instead, what the leader is likely to do is to discount the other sources of information. To say those sources of information are biased, that they're uh, uh, making stuff up, conspiracy against him, whatever the case may be, right? So the leader uses this sort of everybody, nobody sees the world with the leader's vision. That's what the prophecy does, right? It, it creates the leader as visionary, right? If the, if the leader can see things, the totalitarian dictators announce their political intentions in the form of prophecy, to use a, a direct quote from Hannah Arendt. Right? So they, so, and then when those prophecies come true, usually because they have the power to make those prophecies true, when those prophecies come true, then that, that political intent says, see? They had the vision nobody else had. They saw things nobody else saw. And the more other sources of information, be they parties or the media or anything else contradicts the leader, the more the leader can say, they don't have the vision that I have. And then when the leader is capable of carrying out that vision, the they didn't see it like I did. And the followers then believe the leader more than anybody else. Okay? The propaganda for the masses becomes unquestionable truth the reality upon which there can be no difference of opinion, any more than there's a difference of opinion that there are 20 chairs in this room, right? I mean, you can't say there's 20 chairs and you say, well, there's only 15. We can fix that. We'll just count the chairs and we'll know who's right, okay? That's an arithmetic type of thing. 
And so the idea for the mass movement is that the story from the leader, the propaganda from the leader, is that kind of thing. It's not like something that people can have an opinion on. And so whether it's dislike, so for example, getting back to the Holocaust, Jews were the cause of German demise. In their minds, the mass movement's mind, in the leader's mind, Hitler's mind, the Jews were the cause. That's like saying this guy's green when this guy is really blue. You can't say it's not the Jews, it's actually the French, or it's actually some other group, or it's maybe even the German government system itself. No, 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 it's the Jews. We know it's the Jews. That's not even the kind of thing anybody would hold an opinion for, because it's a fact, very much like the sun will rise tomorrow. When you begin to get your movement believing those facts and discounting any contrary information, then you're pretty damn close to totalitarian control. She finally talks about this idea of a leader principle. And I'll use a quote again. Every functionary is not only appointed by the leader, but is, wa is his walking embodiment. And every order is supposed to emanate from the one ever-present source of the leader. Leaders become the focus and the vision for the movement. The mass identify and follow the leader. They belong to his nation whether that's the Nazi nation or the Stalinist Russia, right, the Soviet Union. They, they call each other comrades. They see that as a, as, a, as a mark, an identity of belonging, right? And so the leader is the one upon which the focus is always turned, okay? I think there's a misreading sometimes of contemporary leaders, and we just seem to think they're kind of egotistical maniacs, right? They're just oh so focused on themselves. They're like a two-year-old, right, where they just can't see the world for anything else but themselves. That's a, a radical underselling of what the leaders are doing in a totalitarian movement. Sometimes maybe they are like two-year-olds, but the reality is that a lot of times this is a sophisticated technique to completely sow the movement to the leader so that the movement has no place to go if it has no leader. Okay. So this brings us to our final conversation about what is to be done. And I'll just leave it on this graphic for a minute because this is the solution that Hannah Arendt provides for totalitarianism. We've got a big fish in the top picture and the big fish is devouring all the little fish, right? Because they're all scattered. They're all separate. The big fish is stronger than any of the little fish in the picture. And so the big fish can go around and eat every one of the little fish as long as the little fish scatter and run and feel isolated and all the rest. But look what happens in the bottom picture. The, the little fish come together. The little fish get coordinated. The little fish organize. And the big fish has to run. For Hannah Arendt, and this is probably one of her most important ideas, power is collective action. It ends isolation. As an individual, you cannot be powerful. You can only be strong, according to Hannah Arendt. Power is a communal activity. We do it together. And so what happens is the best way that you break the power or the condition that makes totalitarianism possible is you've got to end the isolation, not just of yourself, but of all of your fellow citizens. You've got to try to re-engage them. She argues we need to communicate with one another on things that matter, on things that are meaningful to us collectively. We need to talk about them. We need to have conversations all the time. You'll probably run into a lot of your friends that are like, I don't want to talk about politics. I don't like talking about politics. Everybody gets mad at politics. I don't want to do that. Especially in a very politically divisive era as we are living in right now, the last thing you want to do is talk politics. When I tell people I teach politics, they walk away. They get a little nervous. They're like, ah, I'm not sure I want to hang out with you. But Arendt argues that's the only solution we have is to talk about this stuff. Not just because we're political scientists and like to talk about it, but because it's the only thing that's going to keep people from feeling isolated. And isolation is the precondition that starts this whole thing. It starts the mass movement. It allows the propaganda to make sense. It allows the, the alienation of the other, uh, of the traitor, of all of that stuff, the scapegoating, all of it. We need to participate in what she calls the political realm, 
to have opinions and to share them with people, even if it is uncomfortable, even if they're different, and in fact, especially because they're different. Because then it allows people to realize you can have differences of opinion, and you don't fall into the trap of following a leader blindly down the rabbit hole, blindly down that propaganda hole. Spontaneity is key. She <laughs> argues that unpredictability undermines totalitarian actions. So do random stuff, lots of random stuff. It will help. And finally, she argues, and this is in a different condition, that the ultimate aspect of the human condition is resistance. And that what the totalitarian regime does at the end of the day is it not only dehumanizes and therefore can persecute the other, like the Jew or the capitalist or whatever group that you have on the outside, the, the Mexican coming over the border, whatever the case may be, right? But that it also allows that individual to feel too isolated. And so the resistance is a sign that there can be difference, and that difference breaks the hold of totalitarianism. Totalitarianism makes sense to the people caught up in a mass movement when they think there is no other way, when they spin deeper and deeper and deeper into a silo where they can't imagine and have never met anybody that thinks differently than they do. Think differently, talk differently, challenge people. We can learn lessons from the Holocaust. So with that, I'll stop. I'll open it up if any of you have any questions, a little question and answer. Uh, we can talk about it from here. Yeah, there you go. Um, I was just wondering, so when you said we might be the next target, uh, were you inferring to like a chance of a totalitarian government uprise in today's society, even with like the lack of isolation within the citizens and the power that the government holds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's very possible um, in, in the United States. I think the conditions are still here, and I'll tell you why. I, I think you, you have stratified media, propaganda, and allows for people to say, I only listen to this one channel and not any of these other channels, right? So as people start to surf only one channel, they begin to be very suspicious of all other channels. And I think because, you know, you suggest that we're not isolated anymore. I, I, I guess I would wonder about that. Uh, humans are super interconnected at some levels because we've got all our social media and all that sort of stuff. You're constantly texting people, but you know, it's a your your connections are a mile wide. They're about an inch deep uh, for most of them, right? You know, your your texts are you know on average probably what like 22 words or less, right? Uh, I'm not even sure. Probably our mass com people will be able to tell us exactly how long an average text is, but I can't imagine it's very long. Right? So you're not really getting into a lot of depth. You're not getting into a lot of that sort of thing. And people are feeling more and more isolated. I would argue, actually, COVID may have made it worse, right? because we're feeling more and more isolated. There's no places to sit in the cafes and have those conversations. I haven't had one of those sit down and have a drink and have a political conversation in quite a while that hasn't been over Zoom. I don't know about you. But uh, when we begin to start doing that, we can connect at some level, but it's a really sort of an artificial connection. Right? So isolation doesn't mean somebody's living in a silo in Kansas. You know? Isolation means that people don't feel that they're, they belong or connected or have anything meaningful to share other than, you know, you go first, I'll go next at a four-way stop. Right? We're, we're isolated. We're interacting, but we're not really communicating. We're not really sharing ideas. It's just taking turns in a four-way stop standing six feet from somebody in a queue waiting to pick up your uh, takeout food so you can go and sit and eat alone and then watch your social media, right? You know, watch your videos, watch your Netflix. I'm not saying those are all bad things. I'm saying that those are the kinds of things that can lead us to feel very isolated even if it seems like we're connected because we're constantly interacting with other people. We don't feel like we connect to those people. So yeah, I think that's very true and I think the technology has allowed it to get deeper. As I mentioned at the very beginning, it's the, it's the last thing you look at before you go to bed. It's the first thing you look at when you get up in the morning. If I were trying to take control of you, I would simply need to make sure that you're using this for the channel I'd like you to look at. Follow me, right? Be my follower on Twitter. Be my follower on, on Facebook, right? Or be my friend, I guess. Facebook's nice. They, they call you friends instead of followers. So that's so much better, right? Um, 
the reality, though, is that, you know, we have followers on YouTube channels. We have all that sort of stuff, right? We, we live vicariously through other people. We're not really living our own lives. We're going, oh, if only I was like this YouTube family. You know, they're traveling all over the world. I love that kind of thing, right? So that's the challenge, is that we create that. I think also if, if people are feeling betrayed, that's pretty important too, right? So ways of trying to get people, trying to listen to people, right? There's a, a lot of arguments um, that our politicians fly from coast to coast and they don't spend any time in the heartland, right? And so there were some politicians in this last election cycle that tried to spend a lot more time in the heartland listening to folks, right? And getting people out. That was harder to do in COVID. I think it, I think COVID put us closer conditionally. Uh, it's not going to cause totalitarianism, but it sets up that condition of isolation, which is so critical. Uh, so propaganda could be there, technology's there, right? Globalization is there. You know, all of these conditions still exist. So yeah, I think we could. And a strong government isn't going to stop totalitarianism because all you have to do is take over the strong government, and then you have the mechanism to that random terror we were talking about. Any other questions that you have? Okay, I don't see a lot of questions. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us uh, for this talk on Holocaust Awareness Week. Uh, thank you for my audience, as well as those of you at home, and those of you who will be watching this at some point into the future. Uh, please join us for other Holocaust Awareness presentations, uh, and remember to stay engaged. Remember to get involved, be spontaneous, be unpredictable, but be engaged. Thank you.